prominently in the new regime if the guard declared for Caligula and Caligula alone. Gemellus was immediately locked out of his inheritance when Tiberius died. The young man turned out to be one of the first victims of Caligula's reign and did not survive the year. First, he was denied his inheritance. Then, he was put under something resembling house arrest. Then, he was executed for allegedly conspiring against the new regime. The boy's unhappy destiny, it seems, was to live as a prisoner of two emperors before finally being murdered at the tender age of 18, guilty of nothing more than being born into the wrong family at the wrong time. After freezing out Gemellus, Caligula made preparations to give the people of Rome something they had not seen in more than a decade, a personal appearance by their emperor. The imperial house, he announced, was returning from exile. The people were ecstatic at the news, and when Caligula arrived, they lined the roads out to the 20th mile post to greet him. When they saw the new emperor, they shouted at him every pet name they could think of, calling him Our Prince and Our Star, and of course, Little Boots. With the handsome 24-year-old son of Germanicus ascending to the throne, it seemed like things were about to change for the better, that it might go back to the way that it had been under Augustus. It was reported that over 150,000 animal sacrifices were made across the empire to celebrate the good news. And at first, Caligula's ascension really was good news. He immediately canceled the treason trials and made a very public show of gathering all the records and evidence that had been gathered by Tiberius' spies and burning it all in a great public bonfire. Those who had managed to survive by going into exile were recalled to Rome and pardoned of whatever crime they had been charged with or convicted of. Suetonius even recounts an episode where Caligula went so far as to refuse to even read a report supposedly outlining the plot against him. To explain his decision, the emperor simply said that since no one had any reason to hate him, he didn't have time to read such idle memoranda. And at this point, he was probably more right about that than wrong. The people of Rome no longer feared daily for their lives and property thanks to Caligula. It's hard to hate a guy for making you feel safe in your own home again. Caligula then went further. He canceled an unpopular tax the Italians had been chafing under, while simultaneously upping the pay for soldiers on the frontier and in the Praetorian Guard. He also reinstated a few of the provisional client monarchs who had been deposed by Tiberius for spurious reasons, and not only gave them their power back, but promised them the tax receipts they would have received had they not been removed from power. To top off his generous arrival to the throne, Caligula initiated lavish gladiatorial games to celebrate the dawning of this new day. At all levels of the empire, from the common citizens, to the middle class merchants, to the rich aristocracy, to the soldiers in the field and the provincials they defended, Emperor Caligula was a godsend. The pious young emperor then gathered up the bones of his dead mother and brothers and brought them back to Rome for burial in the imperial mausoleum. And finally, he renamed the month of September for his dear departed father Germanicus. Yep, everything was going A-OK. So the question is, what happened? Well, apparently behind the happy facade, all was not well in the house of Caesar. Caligula had never been given the training he needed to really be an effective ruler. He had no experience in administration, had not served in the legions, and had been given no real responsibilities of his own until the moment he became emperor. His early political success seems to have been built largely by his doing nothing more than give the people whatever they wanted. Lower taxes? Sure. More benefits? Sure. Higher pay for the army? Of course. Lavish games and free grain for the mobs? I wouldn't think of doing anything less. It was a completely unsustainable combination of policies, of course, but it seems that the only thing Caligula learned at Tiberius' knee during their six years together was that being emperor meant doing what you wanted, when you wanted, with whomever you wanted. Nothing about maintaining steady revenue streams or limiting expenditures to justifiable ends or striking a balance between needs and wants. Caligula basically just said yes to anything and everything, no matter how contradictory all those things turned out to be. With this public policy time bomb ticking in the background, Caligula followed in Tiberius' footsteps and began indulging excessively in wine, women, food, and games. The hard living may have caught up with him because in October of 37, just six months after rising to power, Caligula was struck down by a serious illness and nearly died. 
the people were distraught at the news and prayers and promises of every shape and form of their new emperor. Famously, a few senators promised to trade their own lives for Caligula's if only the emperor recovered. Basically, these were the same empty promises that are often made on deathbeds. Oh, Jupiter, take me instead, that sort of thing. But then, Caligula recovered. Now, a few of the ancient sources don't draw a one-to-one causal link between the illness and the subsequent madness of Caligula's reign, but a few do point to the event as the decisive turning point. And certainly, if you were to ask the senators who had pledged their lives in a moment of melodramatic piety, they would tell you that the Caligula who went in was not the same as the Caligula who came out. Because when the emperor recovered and learned of their generous offers, he supposedly took them at their word. How nice that you pledged your life so that I may live. I'm just wondering then, what are you still doing here? Shouldn't you be at home committing suicide? After all, what will the gods do if you break your oath? Pale-faced and in shock, the unfortunate senators in question had little recourse but to follow through on their once empty promise. In I, Claudius, Caligula's recovery from his illness is portrayed as the catalyst for his delusions of godhood, but the scattered accounts we have of his reign don't show him moving decisively towards self-deification until a few years later. So though the illness is a convenient place to point to and say, before this line, good, after this line, bad, it is probably more complicated than that. I, however, will take it as a convenient place to stop this week's episode. Next week, we'll get into the guts of Caligula's short and brutal reign. Though he was emperor for just four years, that proved time enough to mark him as one of, if not the, most infamous ruler in Roman history. Incest, murder, rape, and theft are all the calling cards of Caligula, and next week we'll do our best to separate myth from fact. I mean, did this psycho really try to have his horse named Consul? Before we go this week, though, I'm going to take another personal moment, as today is Father's Day here in the United States. Dad, wherever and whenever you get this episode, happy Father's Day. I love you, too. Though I plan to show you zero mercy in this week's Grandpa D. Herm's epic battle for second place in the Western Amateur T-Ball League. of Rome. Episode 60, No Better Slave, No Worse Master. The honeymoon lasted for about six months. The brief window of optimism that opened with the death of Tiberius was slammed shut by Caligula before the year was out. The half year between Tiberius's death and Caligula's nearly fatal illness can be described as the period after which the Romans had jumped from the frying pan, but before they hit the fire. Because as it turns out, that while Tiberius was cruel, paranoid, and calculating, Caligula was simply mad as a hatter. Now I think most of us, even those who are relatively new to Roman history, know that Caligula was up to some pretty rotten stuff. Even people I know who have no interest in history whatsoever generally know, for example, that a pretty disturbing flick called Caligula came out once upon a time, and that the guy had to be pretty messed up for the movie based on his life to gin up so much controversy. Which is true. Incoherent as it is, Caligula the movie does do a pretty good job capturing the essence of the man as portrayed by the ancient historians. But the question is then, how accurate were those ancient historians? Should we really believe every detail that has been handed down to us as objective truth, or should we take some of it with a grain of salt? Unfortunately, we have lost the relevant chapters from Tacitus, who was generally the most reliable source for information on the early imperial period, and we're left with a combination of Suetonius and Cassius Dio, both of whom were writing well after the fact, and the contemporary passing accounts of Philo of Alexandria and Seneca, both of whom have their own individual bones to pick with the Mad Emperor. In his Sex in the Ancient World, John J. Younger points out that Romans would often use tales of sexual deviancy to emphasize how bad a public official was, the way that we might say that some despised ruler regularly kicks puppies or refuses to call his mother on her birthday. 
So with everyone agreeing that Caligula had psychological issues and that he was a train wreck of an emperor, it is not surprising that his biography has become packed with deviant sexual activity. The same basic dynamic, by the way, is at play with biographies of Tiberius and will be at play again when we get to Nero and his alleged Oedipal relationship with his mother Agrippina. So I'm sure that there is a lot that the ancient historians got right about Caligula, but much of it is undoubtedly exaggeration. When Caligula recovered from his illness in late 37, his personality either changed dramatically, or more likely, who he was simply began to break through the magnificent glow the people had shrouded him in. In the wake of Tiberius, the Romans were quick to project their own needs onto this savior, Caligula. So I think it's quite likely that he was the same man throughout, it's just that nobody was really ready to notice what a crazy cretin he was until the initial honeymoon period was over. I mean, he had been dealt blow after traumatic blow his entire life, and had spent years thoroughly repressed, sucking up to the man who had killed his father, his mother, and his two brothers. So I don't think that Caligula needed anything so dramatic as a near-death experience to go off the deep end. Imperial slaves, who spent more time around the boy than anyone, certainly would have agreed that Caligula needed no illness to become unhinged. Watching him alternate between the pliant and passive servant of Tiberius and the sadistic teenager who relaxed by witnessing the beatings and executions that occurred regularly at the imperial villa on Capri, the slaves reported that concerning Gaius, there was no better slave and no worse master. Now that he was emperor, he was the slave to no man, and it was all no worse master from here on out. So let's jump on into the fun house of horrors, shall we? We should probably get the most famous rumor about Caligula out of the way early. And that is that he was engaged in incestual relationships with his sisters, Julia Lavilla, Agrippilla. The charges, like I say, likely spring from the fact that later unhappiness with Caligula led to some serious character assassination. But it's worth noting that the perception of incest was not made up out of whole cloth. It is understandable that Caligula and his sisters, suffering as orphans together, would be closer than your average set of siblings, but Caligula appears to have taken things to an extreme. The emperor, for example, seems to have had an atypical married life. He was married four times in his short life, with his first wife dying in childbirth and his second and third wives coming and going within a matter of months. The constant matrons of Caligula's house then in the early part of his reign were not his wives, but rather his sisters particularly, like I say, Drusilla. His relationship with Drusilla was so close, in fact, that during his bachelor periods between wives, Caligula eschewed the custom of rotating hostesses for his dinner parties, instead sticking exclusively with Drusilla, in effect saying that she is my wife. However, there is no solid evidence of sexual activity between the two, and coupled with his more general embrace of living godhood, it looks like he may have just been playing out the kind of sister-brother, husband-wife dynamic seen in many Eastern religions. But the very public role Drusilla took on as Caligula's primary female companion makes it a not particularly hard leap to believe that maybe something was going on behind closed doors. Not long before her death, which we'll get to in a moment, Caligula further demanded that she be included in the oaths taken by legionary soldiers when swearing to protect the emperor, again in effect saying that she was to be considered his wife. So while the incest rap may be a bad one, Caligula basically did everything in his power to make it hard for people to believe otherwise. That all being said, the incest charges only dominated the gossip of the early part of Caligula's reign, because in mid-38, Drusilla came down with a fever and died. The grief-stricken Caligula, who did not leave Drusilla's side during the illness, 